Well, I figured what we could do today is maybe go on a little adventure in a book. Let's go ahead and take a look at our Choose Your Own Adventure James Bond book. So this is A View to a Kill. James Bond, Strike It Deadly. You are about to go on a secret mission as James Bond, Secret Agent 007. A murder detective, a beautiful woman in trouble, a mad computer genius, and a plan to destroy half of California. These are pieces in a deadly puzzle that you must put together. As Agent 007 on Her Majesty's Secret Service, you must choose your own actions and decide your own fate by following the directions at the bottom of each page. If you make the right choices, your mission will be exciting and, and successful. If you make the wrong choices, evil will triumph, and the golden legend of James Bond will become a tarnished memory of the past. Your mission, 007, begins on page one. Paris, France. You have just arrived at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. You look at your watch and frown. It's nearly 8 o'clock. As James Bond, Agent 007, you have a license to kill, but you don't have a license to be late. And the man you're meeting said 8.30 sharp. Luckily, an, an empty taxi pulls over just as you are coming out of the airport terminal. You jump right into the cab and say, Take me to the Eiffel Tower. The burly driver nods and closes the glass partition behind him. You relax. There's very little traffic. It looks as if you'll make it in plenty of time. But then suddenly, steel clamps spring out from behind you, grabbing your arms and pinning you tightly against the back seat. You're a prisoner. The driver looks in his rear, rear view mirror, gives you an evil smile and then pushes a button on the dashboard, releasing a sweet-smelling green gas that begins to fill the back of the cab. You start to choke. The taxi driver is grinning at you now. He expects you to scream, to cry out, to beg, but instead you bend your head down, and with your teeth pull a pen out of your shirt pocket. The driver looks puzzled. You turn the pen in your teeth, and then with a toss of your head, flip it towards the partition. It explodes. The force of the blast opens the steel clamps and sends you in the entire back seat hurtling out of the cab. Though the taxi is now a blazing junk heap, you land safely, in cushioned comfort, right on the back seat just off the roadway. You stand up and straighten your tie. I hope he wasn't expecting a tip, you say. Well, Mr. Bond, what are you going to do? So, if we decide to hurry to our 8 to 30 meeting at the Eiffel Tower... We'll turn to page seven, but if we decide instead to to take a look at, uh, let's see, instead that you'd better go to the taxi company, investigate this attack on your life, turn to page 12. Um, I don't know. He did say we had to be there sharp. Well, I'm thinking let's go to page seven because we got to go on with the mission, right? You're accustomed to attempts on your life, so you decide to hurry for your date at the Eiffel Tower. You spot a man at the foot of the famous French landmark holding a small package in one hand and a bouquet of white roses in the other. That's the signal you were told to look for. He's obviously the, de the detective that your superior, M, sent you here to meet. Monsieur Aubergine, you ask. Ah, uh, Monsieur Bond, explains the detective as he looks down at his watch. You're right on time. Thank goodness. I have something very important to tell you, and this package is for you. You look around. It's very crowded at the base of the tower, and a killer could easily be lurking nearby. Remembering your recent deadly ride, you decide to play it safe. Why don't we go someplace else to talk, you suggest, picking up the package that you are certain contains briefing information and probably the latest in Inventions from Q, the Secret Service's master inventor. Good idea, agrees Aubergine. There's a club up the street with a popular stage show. It's noisy and dark. No one will pay any attention to us there. Come. Turn to page 14. It is dark in the club that Aubergine takes you to, and very noisy. 
There's a female singer bellowing out a comical song, while a colorful butterfly puppet on strings keeps flitting about near her head. The audience is roaring with laughter, and you're having a hard time hearing what Aubergine is saying. He pulls out a folder and shows you a picture of an intense young man. This is Zorin, he says. Max Zorin, the industrialist, you ask. Right. We have an operative inside his company. Zorin has a plan to take over the world's microchip production. If he succeeds, he'll control all the computers on Earth. And anyone who controls computers controls the world. You point at another picture in the file, a striking black woman with close-cropped hair. Who's that? You shout over the noise as the puppet swoops over the audience. They call her Mayday, Aubergine tells you. Lovely, but lethal. Probably KGB. But as of now, she works with Zorin. Just how is this Z Mr. Zorin going to cash in on chips? You ask over the noise. We are not sure. That is what you must find out, Mr. Bond. You must go to San Francisco. You must see Stacy Sutton. These are the last words you can make out as the butterfly puppet suddenly swerves away from the singer on the stage and flies right at Aubergine. Page 19. Look out, you shout. What? He says, unable to hear you. It's too late. A needle sticking out of the butterfly puppet strikes Aubergine in the forehead and his eyes grow wide. He tries to speak, but he can't. The needle is poisoned. It kills him almost instantly. You look up above the stage, onto the scaffolding, and see the hooded puppeteer fleeing. There are only two ways out of the club. The front door or through the kitchen at the back. Which way will the killer try to escape? Hmm. Do we go to the front door? Or do we try to head him off in the kitchen? Let's try the kitchen. I don't know. because something You know how these choose your own adventures? Oh, look at that. Instantly the wrong way. You barrel through the swinging doors of the kitchen right behind the fleeing puppeteer. Waiters and waitresses and white-clad chefs scurry to get out of your way. You gain on the killer. His bulky costume and flapping hood slow him down. As he turns a corner around a huge oven, he seems to slip. This is your chance. But just as you're about to die for his feet to tackle him, a frying pan slams down on your head. You didn't think the murderer was working alone, did you? And now the puppeteer and his accomplice pick you up and stuff you into the giant oven. It was a half-baked idea to stop the killer in the kitchen. Now it's fully baked. And so are you. Oh. Okay, so kitchen was the bad idea. And as we always do in these Choose Your Own Adventure books, we just pick the other way. You get to the front door just a moment too late. The hooded puppeteer is now running down the street toward the Eiffel Tower. You draw your gun, but you can't get a clear shot. There are too many people around. Your only choice is to run out into the street and chase after him. You're running hard, dodging and darting through the crowd at the bottom of the Eiffel Tower. Where did the puppeteer go? You can't find him. Then you look up. There, on the staircase leading up the huge tower, is the killer. Without any hesitation, you start climbing up after him. You know once he gets to the top... He'll have nowhere to go. So we're going to keep climbing those stairs and turn to page 74. 74. At the top of the Eiffel Tower, the puppeteer is waiting. He removes his hood, and, and you see that he isn't a he at all. The murderer is the beautiful woman whose picture was in Aubergine's folder. Mayday. She climbs up on the railing, high above the ground below. Don't, you cry out. She laughs at you and jumps. You rush to the railing, but instead of seeing her fall to her death, you see a parachute open from the back of her puppeteer's costume. She smiles as the wind takes her sailing over the river Sen. You can't let her get away. You quickly take a handkerchief from your jacket pocket. 
I hope this invention of Q's works, works, you tell yourself. Q never tested this pocket parachute, but he assured you it would work. Are you ready to test it? So, are we going to use a pocket parachute and trust it? I think we're going to trust it. We always trust Q and his gadgets. They've saved our lives so many times. You take a deep breath, which could be your last. Hold the handkerchief over your head and then jump feet first off the tower. You're falling, falling, falling. The pavement seems to be rushing up at you. People scream down below. This is the end. Or so it seems, until all of a sudden, the pocket parachute flutters open. You're safe. And just as Mayday did, you sail out over the river Sen. Turn to page 109. Okay, so now we go to page 109. You land in the water, where your chute inflates and becomes a life raft. Wow, this is quite the invention. You look around and see that Mayday has landed on a waiting speedboat. You'll never catch her now. But at least you're alive, and you have some clues to work on. As you swim toward the left bank, you realize that you must make a decision. Should you go to San Francisco, as Aubergine urged? Or does the fact that Mayday is here mean Zorin is probably in France too? Should you go to his headquarters right here in France and confront him? The choice is yours. So, do we go to Zorin's headquarters? Or do we go to San Francisco? Okay. Here's a little bit of a thing that I remember from Choose Your Own Adventures. If you go back to earlier pages, it was usually the safer course. So if we can go to Zorn's headquarters, page 20, or go to San Francisco 29. Let's check out Zorn's headquarters. Let's go to page 20. And watch, I'll be completely wrong. Oh. You are ushered into Max Zorn's luxurious office at his corporate headquarters. So, you're Mr. Jameson, Max Zorn says, shaking your hand. That's right, you reply, pleased that your cover identity as an inventor of a new computerized car has gotten you an audience with Zorn himself. And with your mustache and gray hair, you're hoping no one will recognize you. Well, in the movie, his name was Mr. Uh, Sinjin Smythe, but Mr. Jameson in the book. Okay, so we go to page 21. I understand you're going to need millions of microchips for your new cars, says the tall, handsome industrialist. You notice his eyes at once, one brown and one blue. Right again, you answer with an engaging smile. Well, I certainly hope we can come to an arrangement. Let me show you around. I think you'll be impressed. He takes you on a tour, showing you his entire automated production line. He explains the cost of creating microchips, and you use this opportunity to pull a calculator out of your jacket pocket. I better figure out if I can afford the kinds of microchips you're talking about, you say as you start hitting buttons on the keypad. But you're, what you're really doing is taking photographs with the calculator camera that Q designed. Zorin glances at your calculator. With a, with a grin, he says, that's a very handsome piece of hardware. Would you mind if I look at it? It would only make him suspicious if you refused. Besides, you figure it's probably an innocent request. After all, it is a handsome piece of hardware. Here, be my guest, you say as you nonchalantly hand it over. Zorin examines it for a moment and then smiles at you broadly. Very clever, Mr. Bond, he says. Very clever indeed. He's known your true identity all along. Turn to page 34. Uh-oh. Maybe we did choose the wrong path. I don't know what's going to happen. Before you can react, four men grab you by your arms and legs and lift you off the ground. Tie him to that conveyor belt, Zorn orders with an evil laugh. You look where he's pointing. It's an automated production line that leads directly into a gigantic chip processing machine. That's correct, Mr. Bond. Zorn sneers when he sees that you've guessed your fate. In a few moments, you will become part of the computer generation. Is that your idea of biting wit, you answer? Oh, brother. <laughs> Jokes, Mr. Bond, he says with an upraised 
eyebrow. Well, let's see how funny you are when you come out the other side of that pressing machine. Zorn flips a switch and the conveyor belt starts to move. Unless you can figure a way out of this quickly, you're going to become the world's first human microchip. Hurry and turn to page 42. Oh, come on, we gotta have another gadget or something. You can hear the crunching sound inside the guts of the chip pressing machine as the conveyor belt brings you to within 20, 19, 18 feet of death. If only you could reach your belt buckle. I knew we'd have a gadget. There's an electrical jamming device there that you would turn off every machine within a hundred yards of you, but you're tied down too tightly. Suddenly a black woman of stark, striking beauty bursts into the room. It is, of course, the same woman you chased to the top of the Eiffel Tower. Mayday. Mayday, Zorn demands. What are you doing here? Mayday doesn't seem to look at you. In fact, at this moment, no one is looking at you. You try again to reach your belt buckle, and again you can't get at it. Now you're 11, 10 feet from the mouth of the chip process, or the chip presser. Mayday angrily advances on Zorn. Over the pounding of the machine, you hear her shout, There are rumors you've betrayed the KGB. What's going on here? Don't worry about the KGB, he says. I am worried, and I'm worried about Stacy Sutton, too, says Mayday. She's been snooping around San Francisco. We've still got to take care of her. We will, he says, but you shouldn't forget who's in control here. Now, get out. Look, Zorin, says Mayday, menacingly. She takes another step toward him, and he seems to shudder. Please, he says, I'm asking you to leave. Should you call out the Mayday? Will she help you? Or should you wait a few seconds longer to see what else they're arguing might reveal before calling out? They've already mentioned Stacy Sutton, the last name Aubergine mentioned before he died. You're only five feet away from the chip pressing machine. What are you going to do? Should we call out the Mayday? Or should we wait? I don't know. I think if we wait, it's going to be too late. Because Bond always acts like immediately he has to act right away. So let's see. Let's go to 56. Mayday, you call out. You can't trust Zorin. He'll betray you. Help me and we'll fight him together. Her eyes light with recognition when she sees through your disguise. And she's obviously not impressed with your offer of assistance. In fact... She rips a solid iron generator off its moorings, lifts it over her head, and hurls it at Zorin. You can see that she doesn't need help from you or anyone else. Now you know why Zorin seemed to be afraid of her. She has the strength of ten men. But a lot of good that's going to do you when you're in microchip heaven. You're almost inside the chip-pressing machine, just another three feet, two feet. There isn't much time. Hurry and turn to page 65. Oh, come on. Come on, she's got to do something that's going to save us, even if by accident. Oh, good, we get more options. Mayday is totally frustrated. She can't find anything else to throw at Zorn. He dodged the iron generator, and she's frantically looking for something else to hurl at him. In her rage, without realizing what she's doing, Mayday suddenly rips you up off the conveyor belt and heaves you headfirst at Zorn. Instead of being a human microchip, you're a human missile. But not a well-aimed one. Zorn easily steps out of the way, and you go crashing into a wall. You're dazed, but at least you're free. But suddenly, Mayday's anger disappears. I'm sorry, she cries out to Zorn. I lost my temper. I do trust you. Zorn fixes her with a cold stare and stalks out of the room. What is he up to? And what are you going to do? Mayday is closer to you, but Zorn is the mastermind you've been sent to catch. Whom should you go after? So do we go after Zorn, or do we go after Mayday? Well, I'm thinking, do we go with that that old that old uh, theory? Go to the lesser page. I think we need to go after Zorn. Let's go after Zorn. Let's go to forty-one. Zorin's the big fish, and you're angling to catch him. You jump to your feet and run through the door after him. Zorn, 
There is nowhere in sight. Then at the far end of the room you spot a floor-length curtain that suddenly flutters. Could Zorn be hiding behind that curtain? You walk carefully toward the drapery, only to be startled by a noise on the roof above you. You recognize the pukata, 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 sound of a helicopter preparing for takeoff. Could Zorn be on the roof about to get away? Should we try that sound? Is that a good ASMR sound? It could be. helicopter sounds as if it's going to take off any second. Should you race up to the roof, or do you still think Zorn is hiding behind the, that curtain? Nah, I don't think he's behind the curtain. I think he's going for the helicopter. If you think he's, yeah. I think he's going for the helicopter. Let's go to the helicopter. No, I was wrong. You climb out a window and get to the roof where you see Zorn piloting a small one-seater helicopter. Well, it was right. He was getting there. He's already started to lift off the landing pad, but before Zorn gets more than 10 feet up the air, you rip the building's TV antenna out of its mooring and hurl it up into the whirling chopper blades. There's a terrible screeching sound of metal against metal. The chopper turns over sideways and tumbles out of the sky to crash in a fiery heap on the ground below. You look down from the roof of the burning wreckage, wondering what Zorn might have done to the world had he lived. The next time you open this book, you may find out. But for now, thanks to your TV antenna trick, Zorn got exactly the kind of reception he deserved. <laughs> so we killed him. Thus, case closed. Well, let's go back. Let's say he's at the curtain. Maybe going after Zorn altogether was wrong. Because sometimes, if you, no matter what you pick, you're done. So 110. Say 110. Yep. Yep. So 110 was another end. And... Yeah, except Zorn gets you. So we should have won after May Day. Well, let's see. Where were we before then? Let's see, we were... This is the hard part. This is the hard part. Okay, we've got to find that picture of May Day throwing that generator. Where was that? If we can find that, we can kind of retrace our steps and find, find where we want to go from there. Let's see. it is okay so she throws the generator go to 65 okay choose to fight mayday go to 76 let's try that then mayday obviously knows a great deal about zorn's plans so you shake off shake off your dizziness rise to your full height which is still shorter than mayday and head straight at her mistake Besides being incredibly strong, she's also a karate expert. With one downward chop, Mayday nearly slices you in half. Thank goodness you're a black belt in judo, or you'd never have been able to block her attack and roll out of danger. Mayday takes this chance to make a run for it. You race after her, right into a microchip storeroom. As she runs past a huge bin that rises up to the roof, she accidentally opens it up and tens of thousands of microchips come raining down on both of you. They cover the floor, making you slide right into Mayday's bone-crushing embrace. Turn to page three. No, we're almost at the very beginning again. <clears throat> With her incredible strength, Mayday grabs you in a vicious bear hug and begins to squeeze the breath out of you. Your face is turning red and you can almost feel your ribs cracking. With your arms locked closer to your body, there isn't much you can do except tickle her. <laughs> we're going to tickle. You dig your fingers into her side and wiggle them until Mayday shrieks with laughter and lets you go. But meanwhile, microchips are pouring out all over the storeroom. 
they quickly rise up over your knees, your waist, and up to your chest. Oh my goodness, There's, I mean, talk about a lot of microchips. Soon neither you nor me, they can move. It's as if you're both drowning in a sea of computer parts. In a few more seconds, the microchips are up to your mouth. It is difficult to breathe, and suddenly it gets a lot harder as you pick up the unmistakable odor of smoke. Fire. The room is on fire, and there's no way out. Black smoke begins to fill your lungs. You lose sight of Mayday, but before you pass out, you hear laughter. Is it Zorin? Where will we wake up? Or will we wake up at all? Let's go to page 13. Okay. So, page 13. Hey, you, someone yells. What are you doing here? You blink open your eyes and find yourself staring at the front fender of a big white station a sanitation truck. You're in a garbage dump right outside Zorn's empty headquarters. You look around and see that the fire has only slightly damaged Zorn's headquarters, but it's clear that it's shut down and deserted. There's no sign of Zorn or Mayday. You dig yourself out of the microchip mountain and brush off your clothes. Sorry, old chap, you say to the truck driver. You can clean up here now. And then to yourself you add, And I'm off to San Francisco to do some cleaning up of my own. California, here you come. Turn to page 29. I think we're going to go see Stacy Sutton. The flight to San Francisco is long and un unsettling. You have so little to go on in this case. You quickly inspect the inventions Q has supplied for you. A comb, that's really a knife. A watch, that's really a bomb. A camera designed as a calculator. Good old Q. Enjoy your stay in San Francisco, offers an attractive flight attendant when the long flight is finally over. Thank you, you reply absently. Oh, you're welcome, she says brightly. And then with a smile, she adds, You should come to San Francisco more often. All the best people come here. That's the coded message M told you to expect from your contact. But it makes no sense. This flight attendant was with you on the entire flight. Why didn't she come forward sooner? If you think that the flight attendant is just being friendly, turn to page 33. If you think she's your contact, turn to page 35. Ah, boy, I don't know. They're probably flirting with Bond. So, I know you would probably pick the other option. I'm going to say she's just being friendly. Oh, it's the end. Okay, I'm not going to bother with that. Let's go to 35 then. <laughs> okay. Perhaps we could discuss your feelings about San Francisco in the airport lounge, you suggest. I'd like that very much, she says seductively. Good. I'll meet you in half an hour, you say. A few minutes later, you're sitting at a table at the airport lounge. When the flight attendant finally appears, she's out of breath. I think I'm being followed, she says quickly. And I so wanted to spend more time with the famous James Bond. Anyway, she continues, my message is simple. You're to check into the Caprice Hotel and then meet a CIA, CIA man named Chuck Lee at 8 o'clock in a Chinatown restaurant called Howlows. He's your next contact. Will you be all right? You ask with concern. I'll be fine. I've got a private jet waiting for me. It's you I'm worried about, Mr. Bond. Call me James. And you can call me anytime. What's your name? I just told you. Anytime. Okay, <laughs> stop flirting and get back to business. Turn to page 51. All right. You have just checked into the Caprice Hotel. Pacing the floor in your elegant hotel room, you wait impatiently for evening to come so you can rendezvous with Chuck Lee of the CIA. Finally, though, you sit down in a plush, overstuffed chair. That's when the jet lag catches up to you. You close your eyes and rest. Did you drift off to sleep for just a few seconds, or was it minutes, or even hours? You wake up with a start, sensing something different in the room. Your sixth sense for danger has warned you, but is it too late? Slowly you look around your hotel room, muscles tense, ready to spring into action. Then you see it, a small piece of paper that's been pushed underneath the door. You relax, let out a breath. 
Then pick up the piece of paper and read the message. 007. Urgent. I must talk with you regarding C. The note is signed with a single letter, P. At the bottom is an address in the area of San Francisco known as the Mission District. It's now almost time to meet Chuck Lee in Chinatown. His information could be crucial, but then again, you might learn something valuable from this mysterious P. You have a difficult decision to make. In fact, this decision could be a matter of life or death. Yours. Hmm. So what should we do? Should we meet Chuck Lee? Or do we meet this mysterious P? I don't know if I trust this note, to be honest. And most of the best Bond companions are from the CIA every time. Let's meet Chuck Lee. Let's go to 38. I'm keeping my thumb over here in my finger because it's probably... Okay. You meet Chuck Lee in a dark corner of Hao Lo's restaurant. He seems very edgy. What's bothering you, Chuck? You ask. Something really big is going on, but I don't know what. I'm just glad you're here to take over the case. Thanks for the vote of confidence, you say. But so far, I'm not quite sure what the case is. What have you got for me? I've got a lot of rumors about microchips and a woman, a pretty one too, named Stacy Sutton. Stacy Sutton. I heard that name before, you say softly. I want to meet her. Turn to page 55 and you'll get your chance. Oh, here we go. We're going to meet Stacy Sutton. Chuck Lee takes you to meet Stacy Sutton at the Embarcadero. You walk around the fountain as she talks. I tell you, Mr. Bond, Stacy says forcefully, Max Zorn is dangerous and he's up to something big. My father lost his oil wells, oil wells to Zorn in an in an illegal business deal and I'm going to prove it and get those wells back why do you think Zorn swindled your father you ask thoughtfully well oil is pretty valuable Mr. Bond isn't it obvious it would be says Chuck Lee but you told me Zorn isn't pumping oil out of those wells he's pumping water how do you know that you ask Stacy I'm a diver I took a little underwater looking a little underwater look-see around Zorn's oil pumping station. He's pumping oily water into the bay for some reason. I'd like to see that for myself, you tell Stacy. Sure, bring your wetsuit and meet me at the pier at midnight. A moonlight swim with a beautiful woman. At last, something is going right. Right? Turn to page 115 to find out. When you arrive at the pier at midnight, Stacy is already in the water wearing her scuba gear. She waves to you and then dives below the surface. You pull your goggles down and plunge into the water after her. Even in your wetsuit, you can tell that the water is oily. There's a dark, slimy feel to it, and visibility, despite your underwater flashlight, is bad. After a few minutes of swimming toward the oil pumping station, you begin to wonder what happened to Stacy. Could you have passed her in this thick, murky water? You turn the flashlight to look behind you and see a bright reflection. It's a long, jagged knife, and it's in Stacy's hand. Stacy stabs her blade at you, and you twist around and kick out, keeping the knife from plunging into your chest. But the blade slices into your wetsuit, and the rush of frigid water against your skin almost turns you numb. Stacy is coming at you again. You shine the flashlight in her eyes and blind her. She dives away from the light, but not before you see that it isn't Stacy at all. It's May Day. And now she's lurking in these dark waters trying to kill you. Turn to page 10. Great. May Day again. May Day might be sneaking up on you from any direction. And with that flashlight shining, she can see you, even though you can't see her. Should you turn it off despite the fact that its bright light has already saved your life? Or should you somehow try to use it as a lure to attract Mayday? You can sense that she is somewhere close by. Your survival depends upon the choice you make, and you must make that choice right now. Um, should we turn it off? Or should we use it as bait? Maybe we could try to use it as bait. Maybe, it, like, I don't know how. We can do 
something to the side and see if she comes after it instead of us. I'm going to keep my finger back there, though. To try to catch Mayday off guard, you keep the power on, but drop the flashlight and let it slowly sink. In the meantime, you drift down with it, swimming about five yards away and out of its bright beam. You descend lower and lower. The water gets even darker and colder with every few feet you drop. Where is Mayday? You're starting to think she gave up and swam away until she suddenly slams right into your back. She was behind you waiting for the right moment to pounce. Mayday slashes at you with her knife and you duck under the cutting edge of the blade and grab the side of her goggles and snap them off. In this oily water, it's impossible for her to see without goggles. She blindly thrashes around, waving her knife, thinking you're going to attack her. But it's sore and you're after not Mayday. And besides, you've got to get back to the pier and find out what happened to Stacy. Let's go to 68. Okay, so it must have worked. We got away from Mayday. Shivering in your wetsuit, you drag yourself up onto the dock. It's completely quiet. You look around. But there's no sign of Stacy, just a couple of gasoline pumps, a pile of worn-out rubber tires, probably used as benches by fishermen, and some big rusty oil drums. Are you too late? Did Mayday kill Stacy? There's nothing more you can do here, so you start to leave, but then a faint hollow banging sound stops you. Stacy? The sound gets louder. It's coming from one of the oil drums. You run over and open each one of them until you find Stacy stuffed at the bottom of the last can, her arms and legs tied and a rag stuffed in her mouth to keep her from crying out. You pull the rag from her mouth and look at it and say, What is this? Some kind of gag? Oh, boy. I'm not in the mood for jokes, James. Just get me out of here. My pleasure. You tell her with a smile. But your pleasure ends abruptly when a bullet suddenly ricochets off one of the oil drums, and then another slug kicks up splinters near your feet. Stacy screams. You drop her inside the sheltering walls of one of the old rubber tires and turn to see a boat carrying two men with pistols. Zorin's men, no doubt, heading straight for the pier. Should you grab Stacy and run while you've still got the chance, or stay and fight? Oh, it's, we got Stacy right there. Maybe we should try to get out of here. Let's get out of here. Let's see if we can. Realizing that the arm killers can't shoot accurately from a boat and that you just might give you a chance to reach your car, you grab Stacy's arm and yell, Let's get out of here. Two of you race down the old pier toward the parking lot as bullets rip the air around you. Stay low, you warn Stacy. Give them as small a target as possible to shoot at, but keep moving. You're off the pier. It looks as if you're going to make it, but fate won't allow it. A stray bullet strikes the gas tank of your car. There's a thunderous explosion, and bright red flames soar up into the air to lick the sky. Now there is no escape. Oh, boy, turn to 59. You're on the run, but the gunmen are gaining on you. You can't outrun a bullet. What are we going to do, cries Stacy. We'll fight fire with fire, you reply. Quick, we've got to get behind that burning car and keep it between us and them. Once, you've, once you're obscured from the roaring fire, the two killers can't see you, and they assume you're still running away. They hurry past the inferno that used to be the back of the car, but that's as far as they get. Using your goggles and rubber web suit as protection against the flames, you leap through the fire, tackle the two would-be murderers, and send them sprawling. One of them is knocked out cold when his head slams against the pavement. The other assassin tries to grab you, but you deliver a hammering blow to his jaw, and he goes down too. You peel off the hot wet suit and borrow the gunman's clothes, then you catch your breath, but not for long. Illuminated by the light of the burning car, you spot an airship loom looming no more than 15 feet above the ground. It's heading straight for Stacy. Turn to page 89. Okay, what's going on now? Oh, look at this. Stacy, look out! You shout, running toward her as the airship descends still lower. She doesn't hear you. You see someone lean down out of the airship's gondola. It's Max Zorin. He looks at you, then smiling triumphantly, grabs Stacy and pulls her roughly up off her feet. The airship is rising swiftly now, as Stacy is pulled out of view, disappearing inside the gondola. You've got one slim chance of saving her. The airship's mooring line is dragging along the ground. The end is, whip is whipping past you. You've got to act fast. You dive at the rope, grasp it, 
and then hold on for dear life as the powerful airship drags you along the ground for at least 10 yards. And then, as the big flying machine gains altitude, you're airborne. The airship has changed direction. It's still rising, but now it's heading west, straight toward the famous Golden Gate Bridge. You hang on to the mooring line as the wind whips your face. Your hands ache. Tears fill your eyes, but you can still see that the towers of the Golden Gate Bridge loom right up ahead. In fact, Zorin is heading straight for the Southern Tower. You've got to do something fast or you'll crash right into it. At the top of the bridge, you can see a small platform. Maybe, just maybe, you can jump onto the platform and tether the ship by tying the mooring line to a guy wire. Or you could try climbing up the mooring line and finding Zorin face to face inside the ship. Both choices may lead to death. The question is, will it be your death or Soren's? So do we climb up the line and try to find him inside, or do we try to tie the line to the bridge? Okay, here's the thing. Climbing up and finding him is not what happens in the movie. Tying it to the bridge is what happens in the movie. I think if we try to climb up and fight him or something, we're going to fall. Let's see what happens if we try to do it just as in what they do in the movie. Page 100. As the airship is about to clear the top of the Golden Gate Bridge, you start swinging on the mooring line like Tarzan. You're right over the platform on top of the tower. Waiting for just the right moment, you leap out and land hard on the platform. The wind is fierce, but... Somehow you keep your footing as you frantically wind the mooring line around the bridge cable. Will the line hold? Will it stop the airship? Turn to page 26. The mooring line holds. Max Soren's airship bobs around like a balloon on a string. The nose of the ship dips and the gun gondola is close enough to the platform for you to see Soren and Stacy standing in the doorway. Stacy seems unhurt, and Zorin seems unhinged. He's shouting like a madman. You can't stop me. No one can, is all you can make out over the thunderous noise of the wind. Before you have time to react to his words, Zorin grabs an axe from the gondola and leaps out onto the platform next to you. Bond, I'm going to kill you, is his greeting. Go to page 27. Swish. Zorn swings the axe at you, just missing your arm. Swish, you dodge to the left. Swish, you dodge to the right. Swish, 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 swish. The axe comes within inches of your shoulder. Then with one powerful effort, Zorn lunges at your neck. You step back, right to the edge of the platform. You're losing your balance. This is the end. You steady yourself, and before Zorn can break, bring his axe down again, you tackle him. He breaks free and swings the axe again. This time you duck behind a steel cable at the edge of the bridge. The blade clangs against the cable, and that's when you step in and punch Zorn hard in the stomach, and then again in the face. He takes the blows and lifts the axe for yet another attack. But he's wobbly now, and when he cocks his arm, you duck low and grab him by the ankles. With one massive tug, you lift him up off the ground, swing him out over the edge of the bridge, and let go. Zorn screams as he plunges down into the darkness. Max Zorn is dead. His deadly plan to strike it rich has struck rock bottom. As you catch your breath, Stacy appears at the doorway of the airship's gondola. You leap into the ship and give her a gentle hug. Let's get out of here, you say. You cut the airship's mooring line, take Stacy's hand and lead her into the flying machine's gondola. You hit a few buttons on the control panel and the airship slightly floats up off the bridge. As you soar over the lights of San Francisco, you take her in your arms and kiss her. You ought to have a license to do that, she says breathlessly when your lips finally part. Oh, uh, but I do, you reply and kiss her again. <laughs> okay. I think we'll go ahead and end it there. Well, that was kind of fun. So, I apologize 
for any of the background noises that there that there were. Um, I think if I were to try to wait for a moment where there wouldn't be some slight noises in the background, I kind of doubt I'd ever be able to get any of these videos done at all. So hopefully this was relaxing and I hope you enjoyed uh, this James Bond Choose Your Own Adventure book. And um, yeah, I think this was a lot of fun and I have always enjoyed um, these Choose Your Own Adventure books. In fact, I've been collecting some of them uh, I've, in, at Goodwill when, I, when I've been looking for some of my Bond clothing and I, I've actually been looking for the the old Choose Your Own Adventure books as well. And I've been able to find them for like a dollar here and there. And I've really enjoyed uh, building up my collection. So anyway, thanks. Please consider subscribing. Give it a thumbs up. And we'll see you in the next video.